And it brings up an interesting point because John Tomasi wrote this over on NBC Sports Boston uh, this week, too, that so far the MVP of the series, and Bob Myers brought this up uh, post-game after Game 2 as well on the, on the broadcast, that the MVP of the series so far for the Boston Celtics is Brad Stevens and the job that he's done building this roster. You buy into that, I said I said that in here with us, Game 1. Remember we came in Game 1, B, right. I said, what's your takeaway? I said, Brad Stevens is your MVP because of the way the whole team exploded and played. And... Uh, it really gets down to the discussion of Ainge and um, Stevens and who has a bigger hand in this. And we joked yesterday on air about would you give uh, Marcus uh, Smart a ring, say the team wins, because <laughs> you would feel bad. Like, hey, he was a big part of this and helping helping these guys grow. And uh, I think it was Beetle made it. No, but you would give Ainge one because when you look at it, Boston's a tough place from a destination standpoint, right, for yeah. athletes wanting to come here. Like, there's so many other cities that – you could go where you could play, where you could, you know, be more have have it better for you from a tax purpose, from a lifestyle purpose, from a nightlife purpose. To where, I think it's more Ainge than Stevens right now because, and I'll tell you what, he nailed the draft. It's, he drafted Brown, really hard he, to do. He yeah. drafted Brown, and then the next year it was the Markel Fultz thing. Yep. where he went, they went back, they got Tatum at three, so you got both guys at number three. Um, so you're drafting guys that start developing. And then you all, you also drafted Marcus Smart. And Smart was a big piece of mm -hmm. getting these guys to learn how to play and be pros and all that. We can't just throw Marcus Smart to the side and say he wasn't a part of something. Um, and then it sprinkled in with Brad because what you did is you didn't have to go and recruit guys. Like, remember the whole – you rolled out the whole red carpet for Kevin Durant that mm -hmm. one year and you brought Kelly freaking Olenek for some reason with Tom Brady. Brady. It's yep, just the it's, Hamptons, it's just a bad all weirdness. of it, yeah. yeah. See, and those type of guys aren't going to come here because it's not that type of destination. But when you trade for guys, when you trade for Derek White, like Brad Stevens did, when you trade, uh, you get, uh, what, Porzingis and two picks for, uh, for, for Marcus, Marcus Smart. Smart. Marcus Smart, yeah. And then you find a way to get Drew Holiday here. You make those guys come here. Trades make guys come here. And then you put it together that way. And it's sort of a creative way for to build this thing over the last seven years to get to this point. Um, but I do think it starts with Danny, and Danny's a big part of that with the acquisition and saving all those picks. And, you know, he didn't want to trade them away, but he nailed the freaking draft. He nailed it. Even Marcus, even, excuse me, even Rob Williams was yeah. a good pick. Rob Williams is a good pick. Late you know? in the first round to get something like that is not. Time Lord. Time yeah, Lord exactly. was good. No, I agree with you. And look, I mean, we talk about that Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce uh, deal and how they fleece the nets and look at the picks that you got. But still in the NBA, how many teams are there that pick in the top five on a consistent basis that walk away with nothing? Like actually nailing both of those picks right. is a hell of a lot harder than just saying, hey, you know what? We got the number three and the number one overall pick. Yeah. And here we go. The Jalen Brown draft was supposed to be a two player draft. It was supposed to be Brandon Ingram and Ben Simmons. And then after that, you know, whatever. And Jalen Brown was, was booed. That was not like a consensus slam dunk number three pick. And Markel Fultz at number one was supposed to be the move. And that yeah. a majority of GMs in the NBA would just play it safe and go, I'm going to take the guy that everyone thinks should go number one and not deal with trading back to three and then selecting Taylor. Hey, and that, like, don't forget what else Danny did, too. And I know Kyrie did not work here. He went yes. and got Kyrie, but when Kyrie started here and that beginning, like, holy crap. Yeah. This is going to be something. Um, he got rid of Isaiah Thomas on a bum hip. Yeah. Like, there's there's moves Danny pulled here to try and make this team better, you know. Yeah, and then we got to the Gordon Hayward, the Kemba Walker days, and you know, you've tried to retool things here. And I think the best thing Brad has going for him, what Danny didn't, Danny wasn't on the sidelines. Brad was on the sidelines, so he really knows what Tatum and Brown are about. Yeah. And I think now he's gotten to the point where he's tinkered with it and toyed with it to where he's got the right mixture now to really understand, okay, these guys are going to be great throughout the regular season, but I'm going to need some good veterans in here to help accelerate things if we get to the postseason and say Jason does take a backseat and Jalen continues to trend upward. We still need the holiday-type player, the Porzingis explosion-type player in game one to put you up 37-20. Like, that's... That's the one that got you over the hump. Brad got you over the hump. Danny got you there. Yeah, well, he builds it like a coach. Builds yeah. it like a coach. And, you know, what he said when they acquired Derek White is he compliments our best players really well or something to that effect. And he knew Marcus was important because he coached Marcus too. But he knew Marcus was important to the point where I know I got to move him for the betterment of the two young guys because mm -hmm. they got to grow up. Yeah. 
but I can't move him until I get something, and he got something. So, yeah, I mean, they wouldn't be here, though, if Brad Stevens was not the general manager. Or let me rephrase it. They would not be here if Danny Ainge were still the GM. Correct. Because yeah. Ainge's greatest strength was also his greatest weakness. Yep. Ainge nailed the draft. Nailed it. You can't do any better in the draft in drafting Tatum and Brown, getting the two best players in those years than Danny Ainge did. He also became obsessed with the draft and wouldn't move away from first-round picks that didn't have enough value. If Danny Ainge is still the general manager, they do not trade a first-round pick with Kemba Walker to get Al Horford, all right? They don't trade for Derek White because he had to give away a first-round pick in that deal. Do they trade away, you know, Marcus Smart at some point? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Brad Stevens is the reason that they are here and they have taken this next step. Danny Ainge, by the end, was holding the franchise back. Doesn't mean he didn't do a phenomenal job up until that point, but they needed to move on, and Wick recognized he it. He loved the scouting part of it, too. Like, the part of the draft, like, Danny yep. loved going to games. He loved sitting in gyms. He loved befriending the mothers or talking to families. Like, Danny, it's sort of like, it's almost like that college coach going to try and recruit these young kids. Oh, yeah. Danny loved that. He yeah. loved doing that stuff. Some guys don't like to put that work in or the miles or sitting in gyms at all hours, but he did. So I, I lean towards Stevens deserving more credit in, in this whole thing because I do think the moves that he's made, White, Holiday, Porzingis, puts this team over the top and to be able to make the shrewd decisions that he has. I would push back on the the – the Horford thing, just because you're trying to get out from under the Kemba Walker salary, and you're going to do that deal. 10 I times don't know out of if 10. Danny would have done that. One hundred percent, he had to give up a first round pick. That was Stevens' first move. He took a first round pick and dumped Kemba Walker as a result. I don't think Ainge would have done. You that. had well, no, but you had to attach the first round pick to get out from under the salary, which you had to move from Kemba Walker. Well, I don't think Ainge would have done it as a result. I think any GM does that. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I'm not convinced. By that point, McCone Ainge was gun shy. He was. He had been burned. That that's not even gun shy though. That's just doing your job, you know. Like that at, at that point, I think that's what that comes down to. Not that not the, the Al Horford deal is, is a make or break thing, but yeah, I think I think any GM makes <laughs> makes that decision. But the White Holiday Porzingis one, I don't think he makes any three of those 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 deals. I think you ride with the core, and I thought that's what you saw. He wanted to kind of continue to grow with that group that they had, and Marcus Smart was a part of that. And I don't think you get over the hump uh, if, if you're the Celtics without the deals that he's done.